and get started while you're pulling that up. Hi, the coveted host lunch slot. Um, I will do my best to entertain you and share a lot of information. I am in awe of what you have out there organizing notes. I have lots of notes, so I will be going back and forth between you. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so, as Ali said, my name is Eve Klein. I'm with the Association of Science and Technology Centers, or ASTC. Um, sounds like in this room, some folks are familiar, some are not. So, a really quick overview: We are a national association. We have over 500 members who are primarily science and technology centers and museums around the United States. We do have some international members as well. And just like any national association, our work is to um, network, bring together, and advocate for uh, promote the work of these science centers. Um, I will say this room is super fun for me to be in. My second public engagement job was with a group called Physics Emma Sando Sando 24 years ago. We traveled, Emma Sando Sando means on many wheels. This is a program in South Africa that went to the townships and brought, you know, Van de Graaff generators and LN2. Exactly stuff that I know folks in this room do too. So anyway, this. My career has moved away from physics, informal physics education since then, but it's really fun for me to be back in this room talking to all of you. Okay. Sorry, one moment. We're all good. I can, keep, I can keep going. So um, another uh, sentence or two just about my role at ASTC. Um, right now, I manage a portfolio of projects that is focused on trying to bring together the different segments of public engagement work that are happening, and also um, trying to understand the societal context in which a lot of this work is happening. And that's what I'm gonna focus on today. I also wanna echo something that Brooke said, which is try not to worry too much about terminology. Throughout my talk, I'm gonna be using public engagement or science engagement as sort of the overarching term. I think there's more interesting conversation to be had here about how we refer to the work we're doing. And I wholeheartedly agree with Brooke's point that it's discussing the goals and the purpose and the desired outcomes. That's, that's what matters more. So try not to worry too much about that. So today, I am going to share some findings uh, from a study that we did that examined, that asked adults in the United States about their motivations for, interest in, and barriers to engaging with science. So this study specifically focused on adults, and I have heard that a lot of folks in this room are focused on working with kids, with youth. So let's talk as we get into the discussion for, part about where there are implications in this research for the work that you all are doing. I have a few ideas, but I imagine that you all will find other points of connection. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, I'll, let me also say I represent a much larger team that's responsible for doing this work. So uh, my colleague Rose Hendricks and I at ASTC worked together on this, and we also worked with Science Counts, the organization that Brooke referenced earlier. So Michelle Race and Chris Volpe both uh, worked with us on this. Um, we used market research methodology here. I'll get into the methodology in a minute. Um, so we worked with EDGE research. We also partnered with LabX of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, the project supporters, who you see here, include the Kavli Foundation um, and, and many other groups. Okay. Um, oh, one last point, sorry. This is actually still ongoing research. So I hope that you'll find a lot of value in the insights that I'm going to share today, but I also really, really hope that you will follow up with me, either in person or you know, via email later on, with other ideas that you have for further analysis or even further data that we might collect, because we, are, we have some continued data collection planned and we are still sort of digging through what turned out to be a ton of data. Um, also, all of the uh, instruments and the raw data are publicly available. Um, on the, uh, the open science framework. So I can share that link if anyone wants to get kind of messy with some really complex data. Okay, so today I'm gonna to first talk through our methods. Then, as I said, I'll share a little bit about what we learned about motivations for engaging with science. I'll talk about the, the ways folks told us they want to engage with science or don't want to. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the barriers that people described encountering when they were working to engage with science. So first, our overall project purpose. This was the first comprehensive national study that asked adults how and why and if 
they wanted to engage with science. So just to highlight that distinction, this wasn't about perceptions of science. This was about perceptions of engaging with science specifically, and that really hadn't been done before. Our goal here, we worked with practitioners in mind. We wanted to develop insights that would enable you all to produce more effective and inclusive public engagement activities. And as I said, we looked at um, motivations, interests, and uh, barriers. The overall study consisted of a nationwide online survey with both pre and post survey focus groups, which were conducted by edge research and the study was conducted in December of 2021 that's when we were out in the field. That's important to note, because all of this is very, very, very much in the shadow of the pandemic and we've been reflecting a lot on. Um, what that means you know folks didn't necessarily explicitly reference the pandemic in their responses, but we know that that informed a lot of what we were hearing. We used US Census Bureau data to make our make sure our sample was geographically and demog demographically representative of the population. We did deviate from census data in one really important way. We oversampled, that means we included a few hundred additional African American and Hispanic respondents. And that's because given the size of our study, we had about 2,500 respondents. We needed a, a larger number of those respondents to actually do deep statistical analysis to make sure that what we were um, seeing wasn't just happenstance, but was actually a statistical trend. And I want to linger on that point for one additional moment. As you'll see, our analysis of the role of race and ethnicity only focuses on African American and Hispanic uh, populations and white populations. And this is because the other racial and ethnic groups in this country are much smaller. And with the resources that we had for this project, we decided to start with the two largest minor minority groups in the country, focus our analysis there. But we very, very much think that there's reason to do further analysis to, um, to get into some of these other groups. So what this means is that when you are seeing um, overall data, like the entire population represented, all racial and ethnic groups are represented in that. However, on a few slides, you'll see that we do breakdowns by groups. And in those, you're only seeing representatives who identified as being part of the specific groups that are on the slides. I can clarify that more later if anyone wants um, more information. But for now, I will dive into our findings. So before we could look at how people wanted to engage with science, we wanted to get a better sense of why they engage with anything in their life, what they care about, what they prioritize. And we think this framing is really important. So often the folks that we work with uh, in our field as science engagement practitioners, we're inclined to lead with the science. But as folks in this room, I think generally know that's not always a resonant frame or a resonant starting point for the communities or the individuals that we want to talk with. So we, we wanted to start understanding what do folks care about? What are folks thinking about? And then we could see, is there a way that science fits into any of that? So we started asking participants to tell us about the interests and activities that they are most passionate about. From our pre-survey focus groups, we knew that those were things like their hobbies, the causes that they support, and the organizations that they belong to. And we also asked them to tell us what science topics are of most interest to them. So all of this was to set the stage for an exploration of the motivations behind these interests. So for the organizations, hobbies, causes, and science interests that they selected, we asked them to identify one that they feel sort of the closest to. And then we gave them a list of 20 statements that describe why they might be motivated to in involve, involve themselves with that particular activity. So this was things like to meet new people or to give back to my society or community. And we asked them to tell us using a five point scale how well each of those statements described their reason for wanting to, um, to be involved. <laughs> so here we're looking at some of what we learned about the motivations for science interest. So again, they selected a specific science topic that they had told us was of interest. And this is why they told us they were driven to have that interest. So uh, these actually specifically are the folks who selected a five out of five. So the most uh, agreement that a certain statement described their motivation for being involved. So here you can see the number one here is imagination and wonder. The next is knowledge and skills. The third is joy. It brings me joy or makes me feel good. 
The fourth is it's something I can pursue on my own. And the fifth is that it helps me recharge. I'm going to go off script for a second here because I spent my lunch time thinking about one of the slides that Brooke shared and thinking about how that compares to what we see here. Brooke shared that matrix that looked at hope versus joy. And here we can see that joy is actually third, you know, fairly high on the list of, again, there were 20 here. I'm only showing you the top five. And so I'm, I was trying to make sense why in that study, and incidentally, Science Counts was involved with both. So we know the methodology was probably fairly similar. Why is it that joy seemed to be a, a less prominent factor for public respondents in the study that Brooke described, whereas here we actually see it in the thir a third out of five? I have a, an idea that I'll share, but I would love to interrogate this further with all of you. The study that Brooke referenced was not asking folks how they want to engage with science. It was asking what they think of when they hear science. And most of the time, folks aren't seeing themselves as participants in that. And so I suspect that when they are thinking of themselves as outsiders observing science as some other thing, they're inclined to be more outcomes driven. In this case, we were asking, if you could participate in some way, why do you think you would want to do this? And we see joy there rises higher on the list. And actually, that's kind of nice, because that means they're, in some ways, maybe thinking of their role in the same way that the scientists in the other study were thinking of their role. So again, this warrants further interrogation, but that's the best I was able to come up with at lunch. <laughs> So um, the other thing I want to quickly call out on this is that even though I do rank these as a top five, these percentages are really not all that different. And there were a few others, number six, seven, eight, that were not that far behind. So don't read too much into the exact percentages. OK, now we're going to compare the top five for science interest to the top five motivations that we saw for these other activity types. So. A couple of things to observe here. Well, first, let me just, because it might be hard for you to read. For hobbies, the top one, way up at the top there is joy. On my own, recharge takes me away, and a way to express my uniqueness as a person. For causes, folks talked about preventing harm, affecting change, joy, give back, and it's something that centers me. And then for organizations, joy centers me, recharge, give back, and prevent harm. So first, you can see that overall motivation levels for the science interests were just lower than for any of the other activity types. We also see that while imagination and wonder and knowledge and skills are the top two motivations for science interest, they don't show up anywhere else in any of the other categories. Um, don't really know why. Don't have much to say about that yet, but that's just something we observed. I do want to flag joy on my own and recharge. Those do show up elsewhere. And in fact, you'll see that joy on my own and recharge are the top three for hobbies. It's probably not a huge surprise that for the most part, our respondents seems to be thinking of science engagement as something akin to a hobby, as opposed to it being like a cause that they would fight for or something like that. Joy is really important to call out here. It shows up everywhere in all four of these. So clearly, jo joy is a huge driver in um, why folks do what they do, why they make any of the choices that they are making. This group is clearly already thinking about that a lot. Um, we talked about in the very, very first slide, Ali, that you had up, you talked about excitement and curiosity being um, primary outcomes or significant outcomes of informal physics education. And so this is very much um, aligned with, I think, those outcomes. Uh, I will say, though, that is, this is not obvious to a lot of the folks who are starting to think about informal physics education, understanding that joy in and of itself is um, something that folks are looking for when they engage. So then, we wanted to look at how the motivations people had for engaging with their science topics of interest differed as a function of race and ethnicity. So as a reminder, we oversampled African-American and Hispanic respondents so that we could do this deeper analysis. You'll see I've included six motivations here as opposed to the top five on the previous slide. I'll address that in just a second. So here, once again, we're showing the percentage of people who said that each motivation described perfectly why they would want to engage with the science topic that they had indicated was of interest. And uh, the three colors here denote the different groups. 
groups. So the darkest green represents Hispanic respondents, the mid-color represents African American, and the lightest represents white respondents. I'm sharing this sixth motivation, which is prevent harm, because we discovered when we got further into the analysis that when we looked at these other groups, that actually got into the top five that was driven primarily by um, African American and Hispanic respondents. And this is probably not a huge surprise since these are the groups that are more likely to have experienced, to currently experience, to be at risk of experiencing harms that science can play. Um, for example, living in a place with more pollution or less tree cover or poor water, water, water quality. So in general, you can see that for those two groups, Hispanic and African American respondents, uh, motivations were um, pretty comparable across the three groups. So one of my biggest takeaways from this whole section is that while some people do want to engage with science to gain knowledge, there are a lot of other motivations that folks have, a lot of other reasons. And in my experience, and I suspect some of you have had this as well, when we're working with scientists to do engagement work, they're often compelled to share information, first and foremost, when they're communicating about science. We might want to share how something works or what nuance we're just discovering or the various things that we don't know yet. And there certainly are folks in you know, different communities who are driven and want to learn about the information. But as we saw, this idea of joy and wonder, from some audiences, that actually might be a, a more compelling or more resonant starting point. It's not to say that's the end point, but that might be a really valuable starting point. And again, I think folks in this room are already really focused on that. I'm going to go quickly on this next slide, but I just want to call out what this might look like concretely. So images are a really valuable way of sparking awe and sparking joy. And these don't even require any words. I imagine that for folks in this room, at least one of these uh, has the ability to make you sort of pause and think and reflect and think about something greater. And so um, I am involved with science communication training among my various hats that I wear. And we often encourage folks to start with something like an image and not immediately jump into sharing what I know, but instead ask what you feel or observe or think or what expertise or experiences you have that you might bring to a conversation about something like an image. So this is just one approach. And I'm certainly not saying that uh, leading with awe and joy is always the way to go. But for some goals and for some members of the public, that's um, a really logical starting point. OK, so I've shared a little bit about what drives people to uh, want to engage with science topics. And now I want to move on to explore their interest in various types of science engagement activities. So I'll just share a couple of higher level observations before I jump into the details. So first, 59% uh, of our respondents said that they wanted more time to engage with science, generally fairly encouraging. Take it a little bit with a grain of salt, because of course, we don't know what their time limitations are. We don't quite know how that fits into their prioritizing decision making, but still, generally, that sounds like good news. Also, I mentioned earlier that um, we asked what science topics are of interest. And uh, we got at that by giving them a list of 27 sort of broad science topics and asking them to select up to five that were of most interest. I'm not going to get into the full rankings here. If anyone wants to see those, we can share. Um, but I did pull out a couple of topics that I thought might be of particular interest to this group. Oh, that's right. So 94% of respondents had at least one topic they identified as being of interest. We looked specifically at physics, engineering, astronomy, and um, electricity, the activities that we thought were sort of you know, physics related. And 28% of respondents selected at least one of these topics as among their top five. And I thought that was kind of encouraging. I think it's easy to fall into this thinking that folks are really just interested in medicine or psychology um, or climate and weather. Those are certainly popular topics, but these four were also relatively popular as well. So what specifically would they like to do to engage with these topics? So we, there's going to be a lot on this next slide. Please do not worry about trying to read everything. Nope. 
The next slide. I, I, now you're prepared. <laughs> So we gave everyone a list of 31 science activities and said, which of these activities would you most like to uh, engage with, to engage with the science topics that interest you most? I want to flag something in the language I'm using. We very intentionally did not say, which of these activities would you like to do to learn more about the science topic that interests you? Because we wanted folks to start to think of themselves in roles other than just the learner. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. The spoiler is that folks think of themselves as the learner anyway, <laughs> but we were really intentional about not using that, that term. So if it sounds like it's a little bit labored when I'm trying to say it, that was again, an intentional word choice. In this case, participants could select as many activities as they wanted. 93% of our respondents selected at least one science activity that they thought, eh, sure, I would do that. On average, they selected 4.6 of the activities. And again, that's out of 31 activities that we offered. And uh, activities include things like participating in a clinical trial, attending a town hall meeting, going to a science museum, going on a nature walk, watching a video or podcast, and many others. Okay, here's the, here's the list that I don't expect you to read. I'm showing you this slide because I wanted you to get a sense of the scale. So, Interest levels ranged from at the very top where it says watch a movie or TV program, 38% of our respondents selected that, all the way down to the bottom, attend a protest related to a science issue, only 5% of our respondents selected that. So uh, as a reminder, this includes everyone who selected any science topic. This isn't just those physics related topics that I mentioned. So then we decided to dive in and look for any patterns in the data. For example, what do the most popular or least popular activities have in common? So first, what stood out to us is that activities that we refer to as participatory science or participatory governance were generally much less popular. So that includes things where participants have a say and can influence the role of science in society or how science progresses itself. So that's things like, again, attend a protest, attend a town hall, participate in a discussion to help set priorities for future research or sign a petition related to a science issue. So that comes back to what I said a few minutes ago. First, folks just may not think of themselves as having that kind of a role in science. They think of themselves, we, I'll get to this again in a minute, as the learner. These are also just much less familiar activity types. So we think some of the effect here may have just been folks reading these statements and saying, I don't know what that is. Like, I've never seen or heard of anything quite like that. Some of the most popular activities were about learning and consuming information. So here we have watch a movie or TV program, read a news article, and go hiking, camping, or wildlife watching. So again, here I'm showing um, the number. Of, this is folks who could select as many activities as they wanted. And so these are the ones that emerged as the most desirable. So, so far I've been talking about overall interest level, but we also wanted to understand whether there were any trends looking across different demographic segments. So first, we started by looking at whether interest in various activities was different across racial and ethnic groups. So here again, I'm showing the percentage of people who checked the box to indicate an interest in each activity. And here, as on the previous slide, the different shades denote the different groups. So in this case, the darker purple represents Hispanic respondents, the mid-level purple is African-American respondents, and the lightest is white respondents. So one pattern that emerged is that some for the most popular activities, the top three on this slide, white respondents were more likely than African-American and Hispanic respondents to indicate interest. So we see this for watching a movie or TV show, visiting a science museum, and going hiking. So it's important to clarify we don't have any data that can tell us why this is, and that's actually something that we are planning to explore through so some qualitative research um, later this year. But what we can take away from this is that it's worth investigating who activities are actually appealing to and exploring possible reasons that there are disproportionate levels of interest. It also, and this is I think one of the most important takeaways here, really underscores the importance of having diversity in our teams 
who are creating these activities because there might be something that sounds like a great idea to some of us as program designers and facilitators, but it's not necessarily um, going to resonate across the board. The fourth activity that I'm highlighting here to be a research subject in a clinical trial, again, probably not a surprise, interest is highest among white participants, given the way that we know communities of color have been harmed by participation in research, uh, in research in the past. It's also important to note that for many activities, interest did not vary across racial or ethnic groups. So for example, we see that interest was pretty comparable across groups for sharing information about science with others, attending a science festival, or attending a lecture or webinar. So once we saw that race and uh, ethnic groups did play some role in interest, at least for some engagement activities, we wanted to explore further whether this was true for other demographics. So we looked at quite a few. We looked at the influence of gender, age, religiosity, geography, political affiliation. And actually, we did not see many patterns emerge for most of those. But for age, we did. And actually, age seemed to have a pretty big influence on what folks indicated they were interested in. So here, the lighter the bar is, the younger the respondents were. And you can see that for things like watching a movie or a TV program, older respondents were generally more likely to report interest than younger respondents. We can see the same pattern for visiting a science museum. As somebody who works at the Association of Science and Technology Centers, this is an important finding for us to reflect on. Um, but that isn't true across the board. For things like attending a science festival, there was no strong pattern in one direction or another. And for a few activities, we actually saw that younger participants were much more interested, like this one, playing a video game or board game. Again, that might be a little bit intuitive, but having the data is really valuable to back up what we all sense might be true. And as I said, we looked at quite a few other demographics and really didn't see any strong trends emerge. So let me pause here and share one of my biggest takeaways from the data related to interests. So simply put, some activities are more appealing to some people than to others. Again, might sound kind of obvious. We can't always know whether a particular format is going to be of interest to a particular audience, but we can approach our work with the recognition that uh, not all interests are universal. And that means coming to interactions with humility and with an openness to listening and hearing what folks tell us they actually want to do. I also want to flag that demographics are really only a starting point for understanding how uh, audiences vary. There are many, many other factors that influence whether or not somebody or some community is going to be drawn to a particular activity type. And those are nuanced and complex and dynamic. And we can't always get to them through research like this, certainly not through survey research, which has real limitations. So we are trying to explore some of this through um, some, like I said, qualitative work. Uh, through interviews. Um, this also really underscores, though, the importance of relationships, taking time, investing in actually creating channels for two-way dialogue so that you can listen and learn and start to understand some of the complexities of these interests. There we go. Okay. So far, I've shared the data on why why Americans are driven to engage with science, and the what. What kinds of science engagement activities are they actually interested in? But there's another crucial piece of the landscape, and that is understanding the barriers that make it either challenging to engage or that may keep people from being able to do so, despite having both motivation and interest. So to understand barriers, we offered our respondents 24 different barrier statements about why, about the things that might impact their likelihood of participating in various types of science-related activities. We once again provided a five-point scale where one was does not describe at all, and five was describes perfectly. And our respondents saw these 24 barriers as an unsorted list. In a minute, I'm going to show them to you categorized, but when our respondents saw these, they were all mixed together. Um, and we asked them for each, for the, them to tell us how, to what degree um, each of these barriers might impact their ability to uh, engage with science. 
So we used these four categories in analysis to help us identify any patterns. The four categories are logistics, which are the practical things that might stand in the way for th somebody. So things like, I just don't have the time. Value proposition, so things that make people feel like this just isn't worth it for me. Things like, I find them boring. Uh, barriers about belonging, something that taps into a sense of comfort. So things like, I feel uncomfortable asking questions about topics I don't know much about, so I don't enjoy the experience. And finally, identity-related barriers, the way someone sees themselves and their community in an opportunity. So that's things like, science engagement activities don't reflect the contributions of people with backgrounds like mine. So I'm going to step away from the survey for a minute because we also, as I said, did some focus groups. And these barriers in particular, we think are better understand through the actual words of our focus group participants, because these are, you know, sort of vague, sometimes abstract statements that we researchers came up with. But the lived experience of these barriers is actually what we as practitioners need to be focused on. So, for example, this is something we all are familiar with. One of our focus group participants said, cited a, a logistics barrier and said, we're a family of three. To go to the Science Center and to go to exhibits, it's going to cost over $100. Not everyone has that. Someone cited a belonging barrier and said, I don't think of science-based shows that I watch. A lot of the narrators are white males or don't really look like you. So there's less of that connection piece. And I find myself zoning out more, not necessarily trusting the science, because it's not based on someone like me. I think representation goes a long way in the lack of feeling welcome. And finally, as an example of an identity barrier, another focus group participant reflected, it's not like a library where it really is come one, come all. There's a sense that you have to have some kind of socioeconomic standing to be able to acquire the knowledge or benefits of being in a science center. Something else that came from the focus groups that we've spent a lot of time thinking about, we learned that these barriers aren't necessarily preventing people from participating in these activities. They're just making it harder to engage. So some folks spoke about the barriers they ultimately overcame in order to participate um, in something. So for example, um, this quote right here, I believe it's my right and it's my privilege to be there. So that's why I always do it. And this was actually uh, mirrored in our survey data. We saw that the people, and I wanna get this right because it's taken us some time to wrap our minds around this. The people who indicated interest in a greater number of engagement activities, which we took to be a proxy for overall interest in engaging, they were also the ones who cited higher agreement with more barrier statements. So another way of saying that is, we can't assume that just because someone did engage we must, you know, they must not have encountered any barriers. In some, in many cases, it means they just had to work even harder. And so it's still our job for the folks who are participating in our programs to think about the barriers that they encountered on their way there. Not just thinking about the barriers for, for folks who didn't show up, but also thinking about the barriers that made it difficult for the folks who did show up. Okay. So now we're gonna go back to the survey data. So here you're seeing for each of the four barrier categories, which again, the participants did not actually see, how uh, the percentage of respondents who indicated that at least one barrier in each category was something that they might prevent them from participating or might make it harder for them to participate. So the bars on the far left, the darkest color here are the Hispanic respondents, the mid colors are African American respondents, and the lighter are the white respondents. In all four categories, you'll notice that the Hispanic and African American adults were more likely than white adults to indicate that the barriers we suggested were reasons that they might not engage or have to work harder to engage. But you'll see that discrepancy is particularly pronounced for the barriers related to belonging and identity. We can also see just by adding up the numbers across the categories that people aren't just selecting one barrier. In most cases, they were selecting multiple barriers from multiple categories. And so that means that folks are experiencing multiple barriers simultaneously. And so we don't know exactly what the compounding effect of that might be, but it's important for us to keep in mind.
So you see here that logistical barriers do matter across these different groups. And so addressing those kind of barriers will absolutely help some folks have better access to your programs. But if our goal is to increase equity and inclusion in programs, it is critical that we also address these barriers related to belonging and identity, because we see here that they are having a much greater impact on our African American and Hispanic um, audiences, both potential and actual. So again, this doesn't come as a surprise, but we think it's really important to have the actual data to back up what many of us sense to be the case. Uh, I do want to get ahead of one potential misinterpretation here. While yes, the numbers look similar for our African American and Hispanic respondents, I think we all know this. We should not assume that those experiences are interchangeable or the same. Every individual, every community within these groups is having their own specific experience. And in fact, for some of the barrier statements, we saw extremely different responses um, between those two groups. So I always just want to flag that. Um, lest we start to think about those groups as being in any way interchangeable. So here's my biggest takeaway from the barrier section. There are many of them, logistics, value proposition, belonging, identity related values. But the one thing that really stands out is again, that these barriers related to belonging and identity are most frequently cited by people who are African American or Hispanic. So in order to address these kinds of barriers, what opportunities do we have? We can ask ourselves questions like, whose science are we showcasing? Whose stories are we telling? What kinds of cultural references are we using? And are the metaphors we're using to explain the concepts relatable to everyone? Or are they much more familiar to some groups? So now I want to bring this back to the core of our work here at the summit. We're thinking about how to bring physics engagement and informal physics education into the core of uh, physics department activity. And I think a key insight that I might share is it might serve us well to broaden how we talk about what science engagement is. So we see from the data here that the range of audiences, individuals, communities that we aim to work with, they have a range of different goals, a different motivations, a different a range of different activity types that they are most drawn to. Similarly, our colleagues in physics departments probably have different dimensions, different facets of engagement that they might be most drawn to or they might feel they are most um, able to plug into or support or contribute to. As science engagement practitioners, and I'm going to call myself out here, we often have really specific approaches that we are champions for. So I myself, as I said, I've worked with a science outreach bus. I've worked in a planetarium. Um, I've done science communication training. Um, I've hosted science on tap events. I'm a big fan of each of those approaches. I would very gladly do any of those again in a moment. But those are really specific approaches to engaging various public audiences with science. And so I think, again, it might serve us well to speak more broadly about the range of ways that the public, various public audiences, can engage with science and to think about the range of different ways that we as members of the physics community, broadly speaking, can support that kind of public engagement. So that's, some, that's one thing I'll, I'll invite us all to reflect on. Um, so actually, I, I think I'll end there with that. I think I'm going to stop sharing and uh, invite any questions. That was a lot of information in a short period of time. <laughs>